Legend of the Holy Grail teaches that enlightenment is found not in the answers, but in the search for them. Historically, science and religion have both played fundamental roles in our search for answers. I've spent a lot of time exploring the differences between science and religion, and what I've finally come to accept is that science and religion are partners. They are simply two different languages attempting to tell the same story. Both are manifestations of man's quest to understand the divine. Science dwells on the answers, and religion savors the questions. For millennia, two questions have defined our search for what it means to be human. Where do we come from, and where are we going? Since the beginning of recorded history, science and religion have both vied to be that infallible source from which we draw our truth. Depending on our upbringings, some of us find our miracles in the pages of Holy Scripture, and some of us find our miracles in the pages of scientific journals. As for me, my mother was a deeply devout Christian church organist, and my father was an agnostic professor of mathematics. So as a kid, I was pretty lost from day one. There's a popular question among philosophy students. Would you rather live in a world without religion or a world without technology? Over the centuries, religious belief has remained fundamentally unchanged. In many ways, this is its strength and its attractiveness, that religion has stayed steadfast, self-assured, consistent, unwavering in its claims. Is that some of us look to religion for our moral guideposts, and, and others of us kind of rely on that intrinsic sense of ethics that we have hardwired into our minds. But either way, it is incredibly dangerous to believe that our version of the truth is absolute, that we're somehow infallible. Uh, for our species' own survival, we need to educate ourselves, ask difficult questions, and, and really engage in dialogue, especially with those people that we disagree with. Philosophy is the study of the fundamental nature of human existence and of our perception of reality. So in looking at some of these big questions, I've become fascinated with some of the proposed answers being offered by cutting edge science. And whether or not these answers turn out to be true, uh, really only time will tell. A neuroscientist recently told me that if our brains were computers, their root programs could be distilled into only four words despise chaos, create order. The human inclination toward order is not some mystical choice we make, it is a physiological reaction, like longing for a glass of water when we're thirsty. Soul searching has always been the realm of religion, not science. And so therefore, religion will always feel justified, if not even obliged, to push back against this rising tide of science. Every day, advances in technology redefine our own human potential. With exponential speed, these advances are giving us godlike powers. And with that power have come a whole host of ethical and moral questions that we're not sure how to handle. With a little luck, someday soon astronomers may find life on another planet, or particle physicists may uh, make contact with a parallel universe. Biologists may unlock the potential of the human mind. If any of these things happens, who knows what the future of spirituality might look like. For me, the writing process always begins with reading. Once I've decided what themes I want to write about, I spend about a year reading everything I can on the subject matter. By having a, a, as broad a knowledge as possible on what I'm writing about, I'm able to find those big questions, uh, those underlying themes that are interesting enough and complicated enough that I can write a whole book around them. For me, I just have always had this fascination with ethical dilemmas, these questions whose answers exist in that gray area between right and wrong. I've always been fascinated with mixing the very old and the very new. And several years ago, I heard a piece of music called the Charles Darwin Mass, 
which took the very old structure of a Christian mass and mixed in the very modern words of Charles Darwin. Uh, and this really inspired me to want to write Origin. And the piece of music, by coincidence, happened to be written by uh, a professional composer who is my brother. And this fusion of science, art, and religion really captivated me and became a catalyst for what would eventually become the novel Origin. Once I have the big questions and the themes of a story, it's time to choose location. And I've always considered location to be one of the most important characters in a story. So I choose locations that I find dramatic or that excite me personally. When it comes to capturing the feel of a novel setting, I find there's no substitute for being there in person. It's also a great pleasure to travel to some of these exotic locations. Parts of the writing process that I like the most is the research, and I end up in these incredible places. Uh, I'm not a big fan of heights, and uh, sometimes, sometimes the research uh, takes me places I don't really want to be, and that uh, seems like that's today. One of the locations in Spain that fascinated me the most was the Abbey of Montserrat, a spectacular monastery at the top of a mountain. Here, monks can live in solitude and ponder the big questions. The Abbey of Montserrat also happens to have one of the most spectacular libraries I've ever seen. I've always thought of Spain as a land of beautiful paradoxes. It's a place with a rich tradition and religion, but at the same time, it has this great vision for the future, innovating in science and technology. So for this reason, when I decided to write a book that mixed the very old with the very new, the ancient with the modern, I knew that there really was only one place I could set this book. Spain also happens to be a country that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I have spent many years living here throughout the course of my life, and it was an absolute pleasure to be back here researching Origin. I feel so fortunate because when I come here, I'm able to speak to curators and specialists at some of these places, at Casa Mila or at the Montserrat, at the Supercomputing Center. I get to meet the people who really understand what it is that this place is, uh, is all about. And the one thing that these people all have in common is that they cling to their convictions, either religious or scientific, because those convictions somehow help them put an order to their world. One of the ways that we as humans create order in our world is through language, especially the language of symbols. The amazing thing about symbols is that they very efficiently carry an enormous amount of information. Whether it's a crucifix, a yin-yang, a company logo, or even a personal tattoo, the simplest graphic can represent an entire philosophy. In the ancient religions, the marking of one's flesh was considered a rite of passage, that you would enter into this rather painful experience and you would emerge transformed. Understanding the power of symbols and images, the field known as iconology, is the academic specialty of the protagonist in many of my novels. Robert Langdon is a combination of many real people that I know. All of them are professors. Uh, for me, growing up on the campus of a, of a, of a school, uh, the people I respected the most were teachers. Uh, I still feel that way. And I wanted to create a hero that was a teacher. This is somebody who uses his mind and his knowledge to get out of situations uh, rather than, you know, guns and karate. Uh, it, to me, it was just more interesting. At the beginning of Origin, Langdon finds himself at the ultra-modern Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain. Uh, this is a world where art might include a 30-foot-tall puppy made of flowers, uh, a giant black widow spider uh, with an egg sac made out of crystal balls, and also, perhaps, a sculpture made of fog. Langdon is very much a fish out of water in this world of modern art. And like many of us, he starts asking himself, what is the nature of art? How do we know if something is modern art or something is just strange? One of the reasons I've become so fascinated with contemporary art is that in some cases it redefines what it means to be a viewer. There are pieces that invite you to be a new kind of participant, navigating the art in a different manner. 
origin is very much a Robert Langdon thriller. It's filled with secrets and symbols and, of course, codes. Normally, the codes that Langdon encounters in these stories live in the world of Renaissance art, religious iconography, uh, a world where Langdon is an expert and he's very much at home. This time, things are a little bit different. The arts played an enormous role in my childhood. My parents chose not to own a television, and they actively instilled in their children a love of painting, music, and writing. Oh, wow. So uh, this is my first typewriter. Both of my parents were, were authors. They've both written books. My dad's written a lot of books. And uh, for my birthday, they gave me a typewriter. This was before computers, uh, you know, I still have it up in the attic. I obviously don't use it anymore. And it's funny, this painting in the background is a painting that I did, and it is, it is awful. Uh, <laughs> but my parents were so nice, they, they hung it on the wall in the kitchen. So uh, very supportive people. My mother was a professional church organist, and we all studied music as young children. And I, I've come to believe that having learned music at a young age really affects the way I write. When you learn music, you learn about concepts like tension and release, asking a musical question and providing a musical answer. You learn about tempo and structure, and all of these things are very, very related to writing books. Whether you're a painter or a composer or a writer, when you're being creative, all you have as a guidepost is your own taste. You create the painting, the music, the writing that you personally like and then you just hope others share your taste. Today, we no longer turn to God for answers as to why the tides flow or why plagues spread. Science has answered those questions. We now turn to God for the answers to a handful of questions that science has never been able to answer. Where do we come from? Where are we going? What happens when we die?